the last three months and also the lead up work to it. Thanks, Wayne. Um, just also welcome uh, some of the teacher, Ms. McNamara, who worked with me the whole way through and, and suffered under all the delays, and also the students. There are a couple of students in here as well tonight. So I'll just get the screen sharing going. Okay. So, as uh, Wayne suggested, we um, did a uh, some time ago now, back in 2017, we organised, uh, the, the Waverley Amateur Radio Society organised a, through me, organised, started the process of organising a contact with the International Space Station. Uh, we wanted to pick a school group because that's the easiest way to get, that's, well, that's usually what happens. It's usually some form of educational group. We also thought we would like to pick a girls' school to just try and get girls involved in uh, STEM subjects as much as we could get them interested in it. And as an aside, a little bit of self-interest here, just in case some of them developed an interest in amateur radio, it's also a way of promoting the hobby, which is essentially a scientific hobby. It's a great way to build interest in the subject. So a whole lot of reasons. Uh, the process began, hang on, I'm just going to get this. Uh, the process began in April 2017. I approached the school and sent them a letter. They were quick about replying. They were very nice about it. Uh, and uh, the school, in fact, they were enthusiastic. They, were, they picked it up right to begin with. Um, we logged the paperwork, which is non-trivial. Um, I have to tell you, it, there's a lot to do. Now, you all know what filling out a form looks like. So I'm not going to bore you with the details of the form, but I'll just give you a bit of a brief overview. Uh, they require the school contact details, obviously, and the school calendar. They need to know what the school calendar is. They also ask if there's any previous contacts, and because there were none in this case, that didn't affect us. But I've always, I've always wondered about that, what would happen to us if there were any previous contact, whether they would be less willing to, to involve us. But anyhow, there were no previous contacts. They ask us which language is used, which gives you a sense of how international this whole thing is uh, and the, the details of the supporting radio club and uh, a lot of other details as well there was also some impact on the curriculum and so the school had to supply a lot of this information and they did and the process then began i'll just give you a brief idea about who organized this is just a bit of background information just so that um, those of you who aren't as that weren't either involved with it or know anything about amateur radio. Uh, ARIS stands for the amateur, amateur Radio on the International Space Station. Now, that is, that's been a project right since the beginning and the inception of the space station. And it's actually also, um, it was also on the shuttle. The first amateur radio missions were flown on the space shuttle before the space station was even up. The Australian end of the communications chain is managed by a fellow called Shane Lind, and Shane was the one that I dealt with all the way through this, VK4KH, so he's in uh, Mackay in Queensland. This is actually him here. I dealt with Shane for, I would reckon, solidly four years. I had no idea what he looked like. It's funny, it's that way with a radio, this happens sometimes. You get a surprise when people, when you finally see a photograph of people. Well, that's Shane uh, at one of the international conferences. He has to actually involve himself in a, in a teleconference about every month with NASA and with the other group around the world, other groups around the world. This ARIS organization is a worldwide organization and they organize quite a few contacts with the space station, depending on what's going on. And we'll go on about that in a minute. So this one is a special thanks to Shane because of all the effort he puts into it. He really spends an awful lot of time doing this. And, juggling a vast amount of information and he's unfailingly helpful. So we couldn't have done it without Shane. Now, options. There are two options for the contact available. And I'll give you the details of the, the options that we, the club, that is the Waverley Club, explored as, a, as we approached the problem. The first of them is what's called a direct link, which is exactly what you would think it is. It's where you actually set up a ground station, the, the, the amateurs set up a ground station and make a contact directly with the space station. And that to us was the most pre preferable situation. But 
when I was first thinking, thinking this out or when I was first surveying it, I walked around the school grounds one weekend and there's no obvious place to put a ground station. There's no clear view of the horizon unless we get way up on top of a roof and that usually is a, a health and safety nightmare as I'm sure you know. And as Eva knows uh, at the moment, because we're having a lot of trouble finding a bit of roof that we can actually put a ground station on at the university. And um, that's considerably, or should be considerably less problematic. The other alternative is called Telebridge. Now, Telebridge is a kind of old fashioned uh, conference call. And the conference call exists between the site where the students are, the school in other words, and the Australian arm, that's Shane Lind up in, uh, in uh, Queensland, and wherever the ground station is, and I'll go into about where those ground stations are in a minute. The direct link, and this is exactly, give you an idea of how complex the whole process is. The advantage of it is that students will actually get to see a functioning ground station close up. It's our responsibility, that is to say the club's responsibility, and at the time we've never done it before, we had never built a ground station. But the advantage is that students also get to operate the station directly. At least for my amateur must be present, no issue there because there was quite a few of us. The waiting time can be several months longer and there are fewer, fewer scheduling options. That's because, well, I'll show you why when you see the layout for the uh, potential, well, for the ground station. Okay, so the ground station requires above all redundancy. What that means is that if something goes wrong, there's gotta be a backup. This is sort of the, the holy grail of space. The, the word redundancy is, if you work in the industry, you hear it every day. If something goes wrong, there's got to be something else there to, to pick up the slack. You need a 50 or 100 watt transceiver. That's not uncommon or difficult. Um, a mast or access to a roof, that is a problem uh, in many cases. Two axis trackers. What are two axis trackers? Are trackers that allow you to track azimuthally. That's around like that and up and down so that the, the antenna can follow the motion of the spacecraft. Not an entirely cheap undertaking. It's about $5,000 worth of equipment. A very, very good antenna. I'll explain what a Yagi is in a minute. A Yagi is a kind of, it's an antenna similar to the ones you see on the roofs, uh, on television antennas on roofs, but it's a two dimensional Yagi. So instead of being just a series of elements like that, it's crossed elements. And that's because it's often a, you don't know which orientation the spacecraft is in or if it's sending a polarized signal. A polarity switch circuit, um, I won't go into the details of that now because that's, uh, that's another lecture in itself. And a local computer to handle the polarity and Doppler correction. Now, for those of you that don't know, Doppler correction, when an object is moving very quickly and transmitting um, radio waves or even sound, but radio waves, and, it, and it's moving very fast, like say it's in orbit, for example, the waves are in effect compressed in front of the spacecraft and stretched out behind it. So as the spacecraft approaches you, the frequency, the, the, the signal you get from the spacecraft appears to be at a higher frequency than the actual frequency that it's transmitting at, and by the same amount, a lower frequency as it's receding from you. Handling this is, is entirely the, the, the uh, responsibility of the ground station. This is not done by the uh, spacecraft because the spacecraft would need to know exactly where the ground station was. And although it probably does, it's easier for all of this, these resources to be on the ground because you don't have to carry them in the spacecraft. Okay. And the backup station is another transceiver, much more powerful, a masthead LNA. And LNA is a low noise amplifier. And that's just something to build the signal strength up when it comes off the antenna, because you're using a less, a less uh, powerful antenna. An omnidirectional antenna means a, an antenna that can see equally in more or less every direction. That's a, an antenna that's basically a vertical like that, or a, a kind of a flat cross like that, if you can see my fingers there, arranged a bit like that, but flat, so that it looks at the whole sky. 
It's called a turnstile antenna. A battery, a UPS is uninterruptible power supply. And this is the diagram. You'll notice that there's an antenna there with a series of X's on it. That's the actual, what they mean by a, a polarized Yagi. That means it can receive signals no matter which way up the spacecraft is. And even if the spacecraft is sending a signal that's rotating through space, it'll still receive it if, as long as you've got the polarization switch happening. And then the, in the red uh, squares, you see the backup station. Now, all of this has to be available, tested, working, on the ground, ready to go, and then audited by NASA. Okay, NASA never takes any chances with anything. This is a fantastically expensive and difficult operation for them to do. Hundreds of people have got to be involved. The time of the astronauts has got to be involved, and that's a very expensive undertaking. And no matter what you do, it's got to work. And there are occasionally at times when it doesn't work. It's very disappointing when it doesn't. So they, you've got to go to a lot of trouble to make sure that everything's perfect and NASA does that with you. But the alternative is that we use this sort of conference call arrangement, which is what they call a telebridge. What you see here is a map of the world where there are 10 ground stations with, which have this sort of setup in them and ready to go and functioning and tested and working at all times. And because there are so many of them, more passes are available, more overpasses are available and the time needed, because there are more passes available, there are more opportunities to actually do the contact. And it doesn't really matter what the local site is and whether or not you do have a very good view of the horizon and whether you can get on a roof and when there, there are no health and safety problems. So we decided to do it this way. And it still works, and in fact, it works brilliantly well, but a little disappointing from our point of view, from the radio amateur's point of view, because we would have loved to have shown the students what a ground station actually really looked like. But however, we chose to do this, and uh, we received a piece of equipment, which is the Telebridge box. Basically, it's a complex looking phone, uh, a mobile phone, um, with a, instead of a handset that you would put up to your ear, with a, a microphone, with a push to talk button, uh, like this, okay? Uh, and so the students get to a, a sense of operating a radio. But in reality, they're really just making a sophisticated multi-point phone call. And the ground station, which is wherever it is in the world, handles all the details about tracking the spacecraft and handling the Doppler shift and so on and so forth. And that was what we chose in the end. Now, I'll just give you a brief overview of what the equipment aboard the space station is. They have a system called an interoperable radio system, which is the latest radio hardware. Uh, it's recently completed its qualification testing and certification. It interfaces with a thing called a multi-voltage power supply. Now, actually, I'm just going to turn this off. Um, it may seem strange, but there are different voltages in different parts of the space station. It's an international venture, okay? So it, the voltage changes to, uh, it's represented by, it's representative of the national voltages and power supplies and so on of the uh, participating nations. So they have this multi-voltage power supply, which they use for interface equipment. And this permits the location of the radio equipment anywhere aboard the ISS. And there are several points. It was installed in May. This is the layout. This is the actual hardware they've got. You'll notice that there's a radio there. That's a small radio. It's the kind of thing you might see in a car. If, uh, if you're in a radio amateur and you want to put a radio in your car, I've got something similar to this in my car. It's not difficult to put in. Nothing more or less sophisticated than that, but just a bit more checked out. And in the lower right hand corner, you'll see the voltage supply box. The radio is just sat on top of that, plugged into one of those ports, and it can be located anywhere on the space station. When the astronauts talk to us, they talk to us through a piece of equipment, just like this radio, but they have a headset. That's microphone and earphones. Now, frequencies. Uh, this is a more complicated slide than it strictly needs to be, but I'll tell you that in region, in, in the areas in America and the Pacific, if we uplink, we do it at 144.49 megahertz. But because the connection we used was in Europe, 
the ground station that we used was in Europe, they were uplinking at 145.2 megahertz and downlinking, I'll just go through this, at 437.8 megahertz. The other uh, frequencies you see there are for other different kinds of contacts. There's about nine ways to contact the space station by amateur radio. And you can do that at any time. And you can even use it as a repeater. Now I've done this where you can transmit to the space station and it immediately repeats your signal, broadcasts it back down to earth and somewhere, someone somewhere else on earth can receive it and you can make a contact that way while there's an overpass. Uh, so the, the, there's a lot of amateur radio on the space station and usually, not always, but usually the astronauts are almost always radio amateurs. Okay, so we're on the board, we're ready to go. Uh, we were waiting around, normally it takes a year, maybe 18 months, something like that. And then all of a sudden in 2018, there was a launch aboard for one of the replacement crews, expedition crews, caused by a piece of a faulty deformed sensor, a small pin on one of the side boosters on the Soyuz. And it caused a, a launch failure a long way up actually. And uh, although it was a very dangerous situation, the crew were safe, the Expedition 57 crew were safe, but they ended up back on the ground straight away and not in the space station. And what that meant was that for a significant period of time on the space station, there were only three crew, not six. Most of them weren't amateurs. And then the, when the replacement crew went up, there was only two of those for some considerable length of time. And only one of those was actually a, an amateur. And that was David Saint-Jacques, he's a French Canadian astronaut. The result of this was that they were only doing about one contact a week. Now this is a worldwide thing and there are many contacts that the astronauts have to do. So a considerable backlog started to develop and this put us back a long way. Then there was this little virus thing. You might've heard about it, okay? This meant that it was impossible for schools to gather. It was difficult to get people together to organize anything. It was difficult for people to run ground stations because they were often locked down. And as a result of this, uh, there was considerable delay further on. And this was through most of 2020. Then SpaceX happened, the gospel according to Elon. And um, the, he came along and got his dragon uh, capsule working and moreover it has four places for each launch which means now there are seven crew instead of six in the space station at any one time maybe more than that later on we'll see pretty much all of them are amateurs and they began to catch up quickly so things started to look up for us we were originally offered a contact in March 2021 but that was then withdrawn because there was a group in Australia that was doing a direct contact and the pass just happened to suit them very well. So they rescheduled us then. And after a little while, I received only about a week or so before the actual contact, I received this rather exciting email from Shane in Queensland. Can you have the, the with a whole list of potential connections? The first one was the one you see there in red sent this through to the teachers as quickly as possible. Ms. McNamara responded straight away. We picked the first one we could, which was Monday the 26th of April, and we were penciled in for that. On the right-hand side, you'll see that there's a station, ON4ISS. That's the ground station call sign for a group in Belgium, just near Antwerp. And they were the ones who actually managed the uh, connection for us. It's run by a man called Jan Popeliers, Belgian fellow. And then we began the big push. And for uh, we had several training days, and uh, the teacher, Ms. McRae, and I got together with the students. Students had been selected. One of the things we had to submit was the, the list of questions. The questions then had to be approved by NASA. They were approved immediately. And I must say, they were very, they were full of praise for the questions, and you'll hear those in a few minutes. The students came up with some very, very insightful questions. It was a group of students who were across several age groups, I think from year seven to year 12 from memory. 
Um, the question list was immediately approved and was uh, complemented. And then the big day itself, 26th of April, it was uh, uh, overhead in Belgium beginning at about 6.45 p.m. Uh, the we set the location up in the school netball court, which meant that we could fit enough people in and there was appropriate social distancing and so on and so forth. It was not an ideal venue acoustically, but we managed. One of the members of the radio club actually had to sit upstairs on the mixer and push the sliders up and down a, a factor of four, that six dB means a factor of four, between TX and RX. TX is transmit, RX is received. So when we transmitted, he would have to bring the mixer down. When we received, he'd have to bring the mixer up so that we could all hear it. And finally, uh, the big moment came and we did the contact. Now, the astronaut we were assigned was Victor Glover. This is he, um, KI5BKC. I must say he was very good. He was, I've heard several contacts. I did a, bit, a fair bit of research leading up to this. And I was a little bit surprised actually sometimes, some of the astronauts sound a bit practiced and that's because they do a fair few of these. There were already six in Australia in, uh, in 2021 leading up to ours. There was one only a week or so before in Wimberley in the Blue Mountains, uh, but he was really very good and he came across very well indeed. What I'm gonna do now is actually let you listen to a portion, a recorded portion of the contact. The whole contact itself goes on for about 20 minutes, but there's a lot of preamble. I won't play all of it. I've cut some of this so that only the actual contact itself is, uh, is available and, and some of the wrap up at the end. And then I'll just, um, when I've finished this, I'll, first of all, I'll just test to see that you can hear it. Uh, and I'll just run it now very quickly. If any of you, I'm gonna play it right now. If you can't hear it, please let me know, okay? So please raise your hand if you can. We'll, I'll run it back and we'll start it properly. Okay, thank you. So, and we okay. uh, have momentarily okay. uh, the elevation of minus 1.6 on my uh, computer. So when I start calling, it's uh, too early, but I will try and we have uh, to wait a few times before Victor answer probably. Uh, this is Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra, Robin 4 ISS calling Oscar Romeo 4 ISS for an Irish scale contact. I'll copy over. Oscar Romeo 4 ISS, this is Owen 4 ISS for an Irish scale contact. I'll copy over. Okay, thank you for reply. Your, your signal is not so strong, but it will be better in your next transmission. Uh, we have students here from Australia. Are you ready for questions, over? Yes, I am ready for questions, over. Okay, school, go ahead. Hi, it's Georgina. How has being in the space station changed your beliefs and or perspective with the universe? Over. Hi, Georgina. Being in space has made me really appreciate the beauty of the planet uh, and also the, the fragility of our, our atmosphere, which is so important to human life on, on Earth. And, you know, all the efforts that NASA and our partners have spent uh, looking for habitable planets out in the cosmos, it makes me feel even more special that there is life on Earth. It makes me feel really special. Over. Hi, I'm Nessian, and what have you found out on the ISIS that can't be found out there? Over. Nancy and the, uh, there's so many things. Uh, how challenging it can be to live up here, uh, how amazing the planet looks, um, what we are capable of accomplishing when we work together. And one really interesting thing is uh, the challenges and rewards of being able to float or levitate. Oh, I beg your pardon. That was my, my mistake. Okay. How challenging it can be to live up here, uh, how amazing the planet looks, um, what we are capable of accomplishing when we work together. And one really interesting thing is uh, the challenges and rewards of being able to float or levitate. You know, it's, it actually adds some real challenges to, to, to working and living here, but it also has some really amazing aspects. I'm Tasha. 
Has COVID-19 had an impact on life on the space station? Over. So even before COVID-19, we would quarantine before launches so that we don't bring germs up to the space station. And so life up here is still pretty normal, but it makes us really appreciate what everyone is going through down there on Earth with social and physical distancing um, and uh, how important it is for us to, to live hygienically. Over. I'm Hannah. How do you keep in touch with your family when you're in space? Over. Yeah, we're able to make phone calls. We have a phone system that works through our computers, and we can call them as long as we have a satellite link. And then once a week or so, we're able to have a video conference where we can see their faces and they can see our faces. Good question. That really makes living up here nice uh, since we have to be away from our friends and family for so long. Over. Hi, I'm Elena. And do you ever feel existential terror from being in space and seeing how endless the universe is? And how do you deal with it? Over. Elena, I, I don't feel that. In fact, I feel the opposite. Seeing the Earth, you know, I'm aware that there is danger out there, that, that the open space out here, the vacuum of space is hot or cold. You can't breathe out there, and this machine keeps us alive. But looking at Earth and knowing that all the people that I love are down there, except for the crewmates that I love that are up here, uh, it makes me just feel that Earth is, is protecting us, and we should do all that we can to protect it. It's very special. Over. Hi, I'm Ella. I imagine your work being so far away and at such a vast scale would impact your mental health. Considering this, are there ways you work on your mental health on board and has your experience changed the way you think? Over. Oh, well, that's a great question. And actually it can have an effect on us. And so we have a conference where we talk to our, our health, their medical doctors, and we also talk to our uh, psychologists psychological doctors to make sure that our mental health is doing fine. And, uh, but honestly, being able to speak with my family is probably the single most important thing to just keeping me centered. Uh, it's not even about being happy all the time. It keeps me centered so that I can focus on work when I need to focus on work. Uh, but there are lots of different ways. And the most important thing is that we have a variety of tools at our disposal uh, because no one way is going to work for every crew member. Good question. Over. Hi, I'm Iris, and what was the hardest of the requirements to save trouble for you to meet? Over. I, uh, I would say the hardest is an actual informal requirement that you spend so much time away from your loved ones, your family and friends. Uh, that's the hardest. But in terms of this, the hard brass tacks objective training that we do, the toughest thing for me was getting to the level of Russian language proficiency that is required to fly on the space station. I've heard it's the equivalent of taking four years of Russian in college and then doing a study abroad. And what would you say 
say it's the most important skill for an astronaut to have and master. Over. Mila, the most important skill for an astronaut to master, in my opinion, is adaptability or flexibility. And I think that's challenging because we have to learn lots of skills and you have to be really good at lots of different things. And in that process, I think it, it, it's natural to want to control things, but a very important aspect of being flexible and adaptable is uh, letting go of a little bit of control. Knowing you can't always control things, but then using all those skills and training that you have to be able to adapt when the, when the time is right. Over. Hi, my name is Molly. If funding for space exploration became scarce, how would you convince the world that space exploration was worth the investment? Over. You know, that's a great question, Marley, and I'm going to kind of change it around on you and tell you that I hope I would never have to. Uh, one of my goals with this is to share it with as many people as I can, like what we're doing right now, so that if those things were at risk, I would obviously be able to go and talk about the great benefits of investing in space exploration and how every dollar that we spend turns into 3 to $5 of, of economic activity. But really, the most important thing that I can do is inspire young people like you to grow up into adults who remember that for the rest of their lives so that when those things do come, uh, that you would also feel the need to say the same thing. That, to me, is much more important than anything I could ever say. Hello, it's Georgina again. And do you believe that the tests and studies you perform will cause great change and progress in the way we live all view the world? Over. Uh, Georgina, that's a great question. And I think the science that we do up here and the outreach and all those things, that's what it's here for. To, to it's, you know, there's a thing off the earth, for the earth. We are absolutely working for humans on the ground. But I think there's also uh, an aspect of the way we live up here as an international crew. We have a very international cadre right now on the space station. And I think that is a sign for people on earth uh, that we work together with all of our differences that we can still accomplish amazing things. And I think that's a lesson everyone needs to hear. Over. Hi, Nancy and again. And one first arriving at the good space station, how did you feel and how do you feel now? Over. Nancy, when I first got to the space station, I felt like my brain was working really hard to find out where I was and where up and down was. And, and so that has uh, gone away after about a week. And now I feel like I know my way around. Even if I flip upside down, I still know how to get around on the space station. And so that is a really good feeling. Over. Hi, I'm Hannah. It's okay in night space. Over. Yes, there's day and night. Actually, so we call it uh, insulation and eclipse. So we go behind the Earth, but, and so it blocks the sun, and it becomes dark. And, and then when we just come around the other side and it becomes light again, we actually see that 16 times a day. So we get 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. But what we usually use as our time scale up here is Greenwich Mean Time. It's what time it is in London. And that's how we determine our morning, midday, and our nighttime. So even though there may be light outside, we'll shut the shutters because it's time to go to bed. Good question, over. Hi, I'm Iris. And is NASA training similar to those cost of training? If so, how? What are the similarities or differences? Over. Iris, I only did a little bit of Ross Cosmos training uh, since I flew on an American spacecraft, but I think the difference that I would say is the, the Ross Cosmos training focuses a little bit more on theory. The NASA training focuses a little bit more on, on experience and, and practical application. And I think when you get up here, both are very important. You need to be able to understand the theory and the way and the why things work, but also we have to be very good at lots of different things when it comes to operating safely in space. And it's really great to have international crews because we bring the best of all of that training together. And there's also training at JAXA, at the uh, Canadian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the European Space Agency, that all have different Okay, this is the last uh, question. Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, applause for Victor, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, over. School. Thanks very much, Jan. That was fantastic. Really appreciate all the efforts you put it in from you too, Shane. I Okay, that was it for me. No worries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Um, and uh, thanks, Saint Scholasticus. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just shared a wow moment of history. Amateur radio station, Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra, located in Antwerp, Belgium, and operated by Jan Papeliers. 
contacted astronaut Victor Glover, KI5BKC, on board the International Space Station and spoke with students at St Scholasticus College in Glebe, New South Wales, Australia. Now, for the international volunteer team of ARIS, including the American or the Amateur Radio Satellite Corporations around the world, the American Radio Relay League, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Roscosmos and NASA. This is Shane Lind, your ARIS moderator, sending my greetings to you all in amateur radio term 73s, which means best wishes. Uh, well done there, uh, um, St. Scholasticus. You've done exceptionally well. Uh, very good questions and uh, good, strong voices. Back to you, Tony. Uh, thanks very much, Shane. Appreciate all the effort you and the others put in and the people on the space spaceship. Likewise, 7-3, BK2KZ, clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melissa, you may uh, stop the recording now. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, that was the uh, the whole contact from the point where we began the uh, connection with the space station. There was a bit of preliminary leading up to it, which you, I didn't include. There was a greeting from the school principal, uh, Ms. Raymond, and a couple of other startups. And then we uh, went through the contact, as you saw. I should have explained earlier on that how we do this is that we arrange for um, each student to ask more than one question. And then we cycle the students through asking their first question and then go back again through with any second questions. And the idea of that is to try and avoid disappointment. You wouldn't want the last student to sort of come up and suddenly the whole thing shuts down. So uh, all students, there were 12 in, the, in all, got a question in. in. In a total, we had 16 questions asked and then we ran out of contact. So it was a, a successful outcome. Uh, we were just over the moon with it in the end. When we were finished, we gave a participation certificate to each of the students. This is an example of it. And uh, then um, the, the uh, teacher that I was working with, Ms. McNamara, and also the principal, Ms. Raymond, sent me a nice email, uh, which this is Ms. Raymond's solution uh, email here. Um, uh, and uh, it, then uh, that was that. We were pretty much done. Uh, so happy to ask, uh, answer any questions that anyone has, uh, if you have something that you'd like to say. I'll just put a question into the messages, Tony. Okay, so um, the, the contact period was about 20 minutes, but the actual point where the spacecraft was overhead, the ground station was about 11 minutes. And there's a little bit of a preliminary that you heard there. You heard the entire contact, really. And um, it uh, you, there was pretty much, you didn't miss anything. All of the, the only thing that wasn't in it that I've edited out was the preliminaries. So mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty much the whole thing. Um, any others, if you haven't already asked one? Tony, Wayne, if I could. Uh, yeah, Alan. Um, how frequently do, does the ISS do this with students around the world? Okay, so that's a that's a good question. It varies a lot. As I said before during the during the talk, the it depends how many what else is going on, what problems they're having or not having, as the case may be. Um, I'll just stop this share. Um, it and um, it. Um, it just depends on circumstances aboard the space station, circumstances on the ground, and how many amateurs they've got up there. Now, at the moment, they're all amateurs. Usually, they are. And uh, as a result, we're getting through quite a lot of them. Even so, the backlog, the, the waiting time is more than a year, probably closer to 18 months. Most of the contacts are with countries who have who contribute to the space station. So. That would be a, a US, of course, Russia, Canada, Japan, yeah. and one or two others. But occasionally they'll also deal with our allies like us. And there's probably been, or well, at least there've been half a dozen contacts leading up to that time in April when we did ours. There's been a few more since then in Australia alone. So there's a fair few. And then they go and then they don't charge. It's just completely free, free gratis and for nothing. It's just to inspire young people mainly. I think that was fantastic. It was very, very exciting to do, and oh, yeah. 
Very enjoyable. Uh, just I should point out that uh, Ms. McNamara is actually here tonight listening in. If you've got any questions for her, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them in case anyone does. If you don't, that's okay. Of course. No can, can I say something? Yes, Liz. Yeah. I just read, I registered during the talks that um my neighbor's granddaughter goes to St. Scholastic as a glebe. Right. And um, unfortunately, she only started this year, so she missed out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so she'd be very keen to go for the next one. I mean, there'd be another one soon. So that's that's fantastic. Well, as I said before, the I don't know what effect the fact that they've now had a contact has on the scheduling. They've got a lot of amateurs up there and they're doing a lot of contacts. Uh, in fact, that's one of the, the KPIs, as they call it, for the space station is outreach. And uh, so they might, we might well do one again. I don't, I'm not sure. It'll just depend on a whole lot of other things. Can, can I ask to you, for you, you personally, what is yeah. your motivation to be involved in this? Is, any, is there a story behind it? Well, only that I've been interested in space, which is why I'm in this organisation. Uh, uh, I'm interested in just radio communication because I'm in an amateur and it just helps. We just, with children it, though, with the school with, and children? Yeah, well, it just, it just helps them. It's, it's, um, it's a contribution. It's, it's a, something well, that you can do that makes a difference to people. It, it helps them out. That's, that's really, fantastic. That's, the reality of things, like really they can see the reality of things. That yeah, yeah. It's, it's, very, it's a very positive thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Hey, well, can, I, can I say that the, the questions that were asked by those young ladies were some of the best questions I've ever heard. I've been to quite a few astronaut talks and yeah. I was really impressed with the quality of their questions and actually the quality of the answers. Yeah, um, he, well, as I said before, they were very good and NASA noted that when we yeah. submitted the questions to them. And uh, as I said before myself, I was really impressed with the astronaut, with Victor. He was really, very good. So has um, Ms. McNamara, have you noticed, have you, has it generated some additional interest, do you think, in any of your students? Uh, good question. Um, it's really hard to tell, Anne. I think things like that you probably don't see the effects of for many years. Um, perhaps in a student who has never really been interested in science or physics or space or engineering, it might just provide the stimulus to think, well, you know what, maybe I'll pursue. So it's hard to see. Um, and in the high school setting, uh, a lot of those students who you heard speak, I have never talked. They uh, came on board because it was something that sparked their interest. And that's the beauty of things like this. It just ignites that little flame in students and you don't know where it might lead. That's the excitement of it, I think. Yeah, because you, you, you're right. You often don't know until years later that somebody took a path because of that. Well, like Victor's saying, hearing Pam Melroy um, speak when he was younger um, influenced his choices. Yeah, absolutely. Can I also ask the, the um, principal there, do you encourage um, extra collective little clubs like a, an amateur astronomy club amongst the girls, um, things like that, sort of just outside school hours? Um, oh, not the principal. Don't promote me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> teacher. Um, look, there are clubs. Uh, we don't have an astronomy club. Uh, it's all volunteer stuff. Um, so in preparing for this, uh, Tony and I worked together and I was on school holidays and something would come through from NASA that would require uh, action. And it's just done uh, out of the love of doing. So all of those things require uh, teachers to go above and beyond. And it's okay for me. I'm an old chook. My, uh, my children don't need me. But, um, and so I, I do have that time, if that makes sense. So we offer as many opportunities, all teachers offer as many opportunities as they can. But, um, you know, how long's a piece of string? You could work day and night, really. And, um, a, a, you know, as all of you do, Tony's organisation is all run by volunteers. So those extra things, there are some things on offer at all schools. Yeah, sure. Things that they're learning to life, doesn't it? 
Yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. That's the real world that you're learning about. Yes, a bit of inspiration. You know, I think that's a good point. I mean, I remember um, things in my formative years, late teens, um, they were indelibly important in the choices I made in life and the interests that I've always pursued. I think that exposing um, high school students to this sort of activity has enormous benefits over a long, long period of time. Oh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, the things that we did and the, the experience that student ha students have had uh, is not anywhere in any science syllabus or any other syllabus. Mm -hmm. But actually, that experience might be something that sparks something amazing in those girls. Definitely. Well done. Yes. So, Tony, with the audio that you got recorded, was that actually done by the intermediary, I think, wasn't it? That sounded like it was being recorded up in Queensland, was it? Or that, was, it? that was recorded by someone in the ARIS group. As I said before, this was a pretty complicated concept, uh, contact. It may have been recorded by someone in Queensland. Yeah, Shane said something about turning it off at the end was I heard him say that. So yeah, I'm that's sure right, he, he did. And he yeah. did, but I'm not sure if the actual recording is oh. done in Australia or if it's done in, in Belgium. Oh, okay, yeah. But it. it's, it, you know, everyone look, it feels like you're in the same room, but you're not, of course, you're, you're spread yeah. all over the world. It's the uh, Avenue Radio and the International Space Station, the ARIS organisation that does the recording, wherever they are in the world. Mm. Hey, thanks everyone for listening. And thanks also for Ms. McNamara for coming along. You're very good. Mm. It was such, such a good talk with um, the way that Victor answered the questions, though, that yeah. was the thing too. It was really very very switched on to the answering them properly so mm -hmm. i don't think it would, anybody would have been disappointed hearing them. it was like they were in the room at the same time just listening to it from our perspective it was so good mm -hmm. so excellent tony you did such a good job organizing it too i can imagine how much frustration you've had over the last couple of years trying to get the whole thing done <laughs> and then it's not, it's not just me it's also the teacher Ms. McNamara, because as she said you know i, I was sending her emails at all times you know <laughs> Holidays, not holidays, whatever it came <laughs> up. So all the same. Yeah. But uh, she was always good about that and always answered and always helped out. All right. Wayne, <laughs> Wayne, Tony, I've got a bit of a question I'd like to ask. Um, you, you were saying there's a lot of, uh, quite a queue of like people to get involved. But I would have thought with Australia, the space station, basically the only people that could communicate would it would be individual amateurs with those base stations, all these particular stations in Queensland or whatever. So I would have thought that, you know, there would be not so many base stations that could communicate with ISS so that maybe those ones in Australia would have some privilege. But for all I know, maybe there's uh, other nations with, with which the, the, the uh, transmitters on the ISS can see. But to my way of thinking, you know, when it's overhead, you, you'd think that the Australians would would be in a better position to reach out to the ISS. Well, um, there are anyone can do it, but you've got to register through ARIS and be audited, as I said before. So the process of actually becoming a ground station and in fee being fed into the net is a complicated business. There are ten or eleven permanent stations around the world, as I said before. I showed you that map, and there are two of those in Australia. One of them is in South Australia. The other ones in Queensland, but uh, technically the, the club I'm in could have set that up. It's just that it would have meant that the whole process took even longer than it, it already did, just because of the, the the checkout and the auditing process of being allowed to be in the network to do the work to do the contact for them. So, so Tony, I have a question for you. Then is is the um, your club, which I'm sort of a member of as well. Um, considering doing that so that it could be something that could be done more often from Sydney? Yes, it is. Um, and so. one, of the, one of the things I'm going to do is approach uh, uh, the people at the uh, observatory, um, most notably uh, whoever's in charge there now. I'm not sure. Andy's. The, nobody's in charge. No, no, nobody's in charge. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk to somebody there, okay? So, and um, 
we'll see if we can set up a ground station there. But it's it's a non-trivial process. Just ask Eva, he knows. Mm. <laughs> Talk to Anne, because she's at the observe, she'd be up there for well, yeah, I know I'm just never there at the moment. Yeah. Well, nobody nobody's there at the moment, really. So but could could it work on just out of curiosity, could it be put on the top of like a high-rise apartment building? Yes, it could do that. Anywhere where you have a good view of the horizon, you know the rules. You, you, I mm. taught you, you know how to do it. It's sort uh, of, yeah. 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 Where, where you've got a good view of the sky and especially a good view of the horizon so that you make maximum use of the uh, pass. But in, in some sense, Tony, if it's th this indirect route sounds like it's actually more effective in many ways in that one doesn't have to be an expert to connect to the, um, the ground station, you know, because it's a group who've already got that expertise. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Eva, but we still want to do it. That's right. Radio is partly about build it. Yeah, and, that's right. And, and, and it and may well be, it may well and be learning the rules and all that stuff. Yeah. And it may well be even that we also track, you know, other satellites, you know, say, for example, oh, I don't know, Kuaba, something like that. <laughs> and I thought you were, you were wanting to say Kuaba 1, weren't you? Kuaba 1 and 2, yeah, any of us. Thanks for listening, everyone. That's back to you, Wayne. Okay, thanks very much for that, Tony. I've just got a uh, 